WEDS Auckland 2020 is an online series of talks from women sharing their stories about their work and career contributions across many industries and in academia. WEDS Auckland is an independent event organised by the University of Auckland Faculty of Engineering to coincide with the annual Global Women in Data Science Conference. I'm Rosalind Archer, a WIDS Ambassador, and I'm delighted to be sharing these inspiring talks. I'd like to thank the WIDS Auckland sponsors, Gold sponsors Stats New Zealand, Silver sponsors SAS, the Ministry of Business, Innovation and Employment, Finity Consulting, Servian, Todd Digital, and Red Hat. This talk is from Catherine Watson, who's an academic in the Electrical, Computer and Software Engineering Department at University of Auckland. Catherine's looking at data science applications in speech science, especially with regards to te reo Māori. Kia ora, uh, my name is Catherine Watson and I'm from the Department of Electrical, Computer and Software Engineering at the University of Auckland. My research area is speech, I've been working for a very long time and I'm going to be talking to you about the types of analysis that I do and putting it in the context of data science. So speech is an incredible signal. It's rich in so much information. It's got linguistic meaning. So that's the phonemes and the, the prosody. It carries paralinguistic meaning. So my emotion, our emotions, the intent. And it also conveys information about the physical characteristics of the speaker. I just want you to listen to the following four sentences was far worse than it is today. It was far worse than it is today. It was far worse than it is today. Oops, that was It was far worse than it is today. It was far worse than it is today. Now, when you listen to those people speaking, you could probably make some estimates about age. You might have thought that some were quite elderly. There was some quite young, some just in the middle. You would have made some, potentially some thoughts about the people's, uh, whether English was their first or their second language. You may also have placed sort of some sort of estimate if you, you know, potentially on their, um, their gender which um, doesn't always match with particular voice qualities, but it can do. So all of that information is in the speech signal and we're able to pull it out. Our ears are constantly doing signal analysis in our brain. And so we can pull this information out by doing acoustic analysis. And this is what I do. So we've got a speech signal here um, in the top view graph. I've just realized you can't see that, so I'm just gonna do the pointer, there's a pointer. So the top view graph here is um, time domain speech, it's, and then what we've got here is what we call the frequency domain representation of speech. So this is gives a completely different view of speech, same signal, but enabling us to pull out different informations. And this is what we call, uh, in musical terms, like the, the timbre, the color of, different sounds. This is a measure of the loudness and we can see that the loudness is related to the height of the, um, the pressure wave. This is a measure of the pitch, which is the melody of the speech. And these coloured lines here are actually what I spend a lot of time working on, which is a formants. And formants give us a lot of information actually about the shape the vocal tract and position of the tongues and very, very powerful in the use of analysis. So I want to talk to you a little bit more about formants because this is what I've spent a lot of time analysing in speech. So we have two plots here um, of data collected from male speakers and female speakers. And each of those dots represents a measured um, vowel, a, a measured feature of the first formant and the second formant. And you can see that they form 
this for the both for the male and the females because and there's many speakers in this group um that's collected from brooke ross's master's thesis you can see that there's a there's a distinctive shape here very similar and, and this is to be expected because as i said the formants actually give us information about the articulators and we can see these dark letter-like symbols are actually ipa phonemic symbols and that is telling us where the median values for the 11 different monophthongs in english are these are from speakers from auckland and so we can sort of see that the the, the data clustered around this this is the e vowels in the in the word fleece um, is clustered around the data around this E symbol will be the fleece type vowels. It's not, not the word, it's not from the word fleece, but vowel sounds which sound like E. Whereas down here we've got an R sound. So the dots around here are from words which, which have got the, the R vowel in it. So we've done, I've done a lot of work in, in this is called acoustic phonetics in, in collecting people's um, and analyzing people's speech. So this is, is from a study we did a very long time ago where we took the Christmas messages of the Queen at three different time periods, sort of from the 50s, the 60s, and the 80s. And we did it, we, we extracted all of the vowels from her Christmas messages. So that was about each Christmas message which was about uh, six minutes long. And we investigated vowels and stress positions. So these, this is a sort of a linguistic um, criteria. And we extracted 2,337 vowel tokens. Now this actually took a really long time. We had four people labeling the data and it took several months. But from this data, here we've got the first and the second formants, um, we were able to get a sense of how the Queen's speech had changed over time. And we showed that even though the Queen's speech is meant to be a standard, in fact, her speech changed over time, just like the rest of us. And what we found in particular was that this, this oo vowel, as in the word hood, um, basically it, we say it fronted, it meant it, that it was produced with the tongue in a more of a front position over time. So the Queen sort of went from a oo to a oo. So that relates to something that I wanted to mention before is about the fact that how the first and the second formant are related to the articulators. So as the first formant increases, it indicates that the, the jaw is getting more open. And as the second formant decreases, it indicates that the tongue, that bulk of the tongue is moving further and further back in the mouth. So what this means is that we can then sort of do comparisons between different populations. So this is from a study, again, I did a long time ago, where we compared New Zealand English and Australian English. We had 21, in this case, we had 21 New Zealand English speakers. We had 21 Australian English speakers. We looked at isolated words, unlike continuous speech before. And we had... Um, sort of a similar number of vowel tokens for New Zealand English, quite a lot less for Australian English. Uh, but in this labelling, it took one person, again, months to do. It took a long time. You have to go through the data, you have to identify the, 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 the segments that you want to look at, and you mark them up and you have to extract them. But this was like the first time people had done a comparison in Australia and New Zealand English for a long time. And even though the Englishes are still changing, um, we, we, what we can see here, and I'm not using the phonetic fonts here, but rather putting them in what's called an HVD context, so they're actual words. So you can see, for example, that here's the New Zealand HID vowel that they, all, every, all the Australians like to tease us about, HID, whereas the Australians, it's up here, they say HEED, which means we go HID, HEED. So this is telling us that the Australians, when they say HEED, H-I-D, they're their tongue is further, the bulk of their tongue is further forward in their mouth and their jaw is more closed. Uh, another one is that we say uh, had, whereas the Australians say had. And so we're able to actually 
from these diagrams predict and we can take our measurement, tons and tons of data, and we can then, when we compare two different accents, we can then work out where the tongue should be in order to sound more like the, the language that we wish to study. So another project I was involved in is where we looked at how Māori has changed over time. We're very, very fortunate we were able to, um, we had recordings of historical elders born in the 1880s, present-day elders born in the 1930s and young speakers of Māori born in around the 1980s, 1990s. In this study, we had about 62 speakers all up, and we analysed nearly 20,000 vowel tokens extracted from stress positions in conversational speech. Now, this labelling actually took years. Uh, it took a very long time to do, but... Uh, we also, this was a lot more recent, um, so we, we started the study back in 2004, I think, yep, and, um, and, and by these days the tools started to get a little bit more uh, sophisticated, but still huge amounts of data for an order of us to, under, to, to be able to see what's going on in speech. And what we found in, for the, for, um, the, when we're looking at sound change into their Māori, we, want, we, we also found that over time, the vowels were changing. And uh, for te reo Māori, we actually found that the U vowel was, was going more front or in the mouth, and the E vowel was um, what's called being raised. And so these are the kinds of things that you can do. You need lots and lots of data for speech. You can't just take one token because it, 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 it's a statistical process, it's a random process, and you need to have lots and lots of measurements. And, and this is one of the important things with speech. And um, it, it's why it actually takes a long time to develop speech technology, because speech technology is based on pattern matching, and pattern matching, in order to have a robust model, you need to have lots and lots of data. So one of the things that we did from our study, which was a linguistic study looking at how Māori changed over time, was that when we went and took our work out to the community, um, many in the Māori community were saying, look, this is fantastic, um, being able to sort of see the difference between our elder speakers and the young speakers, and would you be able to provide us with a visual feedback system in which we could then compare our speech to the elders. And so this led us to the, the um, Māori um, pronunciation tool, which we call Empai. And this is a we're still a work in progress. And uh, again, look, we've got our formant plots, which I was telling you about before. And we're using the data here. This, this, is, the, this is a distribution, so this is the means, and then the sort of the, um, the, the first, uh, the, the, the takes up to the second standard deviation, the variation in our, for in this case, the present day elders, the, the women speakers. And so this is my uh, attempt at trying to get one of the sounds correct. And so we're doing this tracking in real time. And we've been experimenting with different ways of displaying the information, whether we do it in a traditional form of plot or more just focus on getting a target. So that's one example of speech technology, but of course the, the, the speech technology that people are more familiar with are both speech recognition and speech synthesis. Now both speech recognition and speech synthesis require large amounts of data, huge amounts of data, hours and hours of data in order to work. I'm gonna focus on continuing on on our work in speech synthesis and actually focus on our building of our Te Reo Māori voice, um, which was directly come from the project that I was just telling you about before. So in speech synthesis, what you have to do is that you have to, first of all, you have to build a model. And in order to build a model, you have to have a large speech corpus, which has got many, many, many recordings. And then from those many, many recordings, you want to be able, you have to basically label that data, and that data has to be um, down at the phonetic level. You need to 
transform it into the, the uh, frequency domain because that's the much better domain in which to use to model speech. And then you have to train what's called um, hidden Markov models for all of that. It's not actually the different sounds, it's the different combinations of sounds. So because because we don't we don't produce sounds in isolation, we need to create we need to also model the environment that sounds um, come from and go to. And so th this requires a lot of data. This is a, a hidden Markov model system. Nowadays, people are using um, deep neural networks and networks to do speech synthesis. That takes even more data. I want to just sort of walk you through what we did to create a Tavamaori voice. So we uh, had a collection, we had to have script uh, to, in order to make the recordings. And so the recordings are all from the ex excerpts of Ngā Mahi a Ngā Tupuna. The text was broken up into phrases and the phrases were informed by the punctuation in the text. And we uh, had 1,030 sentences were recorded and this ensured that we had what we call full diphone coverage. So that's um, all possible combinations of two sounds. These recordings took us approximately 12 hours to complete, but of course we don't do that in one day. It has to happen over a long period of time. So it, it's a big ask for one person. Now, in our system, the Te Reo Māori um, TDS system, the way that it works is you can put it in any text with macrons, not, depending on what's appropriate. The TDS system does uh, raw text analysis and then it does linguistic analysis, so it's got to decide the syllables and where the stress is and if there is any kind of uh, um, prosody involved. And then the waveform is generated and out comes in synthetic speech. Now this linguistic analysis is informed by data, of course. You need to have a huge te reo Māori lexicon. So that is a lot of, you've got to collect that data, you've got to have all of the possible words and how they're pronounced. And then, because you can't cover everything, you've got to have what's called letter the sound rules. And then, of course, for the waveform generation, you've got to have all of these recordings. And it's a lot of causing, and they're not just recordings, they have to be properly annotated as well. So you're not just dealing with a lot of data, that data has to be prepared in a very precise manner. So this is just to sort of show you, I was talking about we want to break it down to the sounds, and so we actually used um, automated tools, this is called a Montreal Forced Aligner, we put in the WAV files, we put in an, an estimate of what we think the text uh, will be. Well, basically, we also have to have a transcription, and we also so words, and then at the phonetic level, and then we put in our dictionary, which is also a whole lot of data, if you like, which also we had to create. And when that all goes into the Montreal Forced Aligner, which is an open source system, and what comes out is phonetically aligned data in a specific format which we then use to go and build um, the TDS system. So this is an example of our system. So this is, our uh, first of all, play the natural, some natural speech. E mihi ana ki aia, o ti rā, ko tau, ko machu, ko Māui, ko Queeni. And this is what our synthetic speech of that sounds like. E mihi ana ki aia, o ti rā, ko tau, ko Mātiu, ko Māui, ko Queeni. Okay, now that was actually the same person, was the, the natural speaker and a synthetic version of what they had to say. So you can see that it's, um, well, we believe it's understandable and that, but it's, we've got a long way to go. We, you know, this is at the, the, the very, very start, but it's still um, a synthetic te reo Māori voice. So, what I, I just want to talk to you just about, I've talked to you about some possibilities and, and speech is just a brilliant signal. But I just want to like finish off, like just in a sense, pulling the brake a bit and just, and just some words of caution. So first off, 
any speech technology, whether it's speech recognition, whether it's speech synthesis, whether it's speaker uh, verification, it requires a lot, a lot of training data. And at least some of this training data has to be hand labeled. It is time intensive. So the large languages like English, Chinese, Spanish, Hindi, they've actually got a lot of people working on those languages, particularly America, with the English is particularly American English. Lots of people, in fact, they have people from other countries working on their, their Englishes. And so the resources for those are very, very good. But when it comes to less standard variants, even like New Zealand English um, has got its own quirks and it's not properly represented in the speech technology world. But when you've got languages which have got far fewer speakers, which we call under-resourced under, under languages. Um, and this includes Māori and any of the languages in the Pacific, then it's very, very hard to get large lots of data in order to build these speech synthesis and speech recognition systems. We're very lucky in New Zealand that there's um, Tehiku Media and Dragonfly have actually bought, um, not bought, they've built a, a very, very clever speech recognition system for Te Reo Māori. But um, they're a radio station, a te, te Heku Media, and so they have access to a lot of um, speech and they can also get permission from their speakers. It's very, as I say, it's very, very hard to collect this data. Now, as you would have noticed, in, in actual fact, because we, I've done a lot of um, linguistic studies, I actually have a lot of speech corpora, but you need to um, be very wary that um, these corpora can be potentially used for purposes that the original participants did not agree to. And, and this is a huge ethical issue. And we, we need to be very responsible for this. So take, for example, the speech synthesizer. We actually had um, speech that we could have created a speech synthesizer from some of our other recordings. But the point was that those people never gave us permission to use the speech in that way. And when you have synthetic speech and you're building it around one person, even from an av average voice, then the speech synthesizer can say things that the original people would have never said and been deeply uncomfortable in saying. The speech, and you've got to realise that speech is a tongue, it's something inherently human. So we have to be very, very careful when we're building our speech technology. And that is why when we built our Te Reo Māori voice, that the person explicitly gave permission to use their voice. The other thing about speech and speech systems is that you require a lot of data. And where is that data going to be stored? And often it's stored in the cloud. And, and, and often like people might have client server models for their speech recognition systems or their speech synthesis systems. But the question is, the cloud is not a cloud. The data is stored somewhere and it can be off in another country. And then that data is actually, the, the, the storage of it is actually ruled by the laws of that country, not the country of origin. And so there's huge issues about data sovereignty. And there's other issues about the fact that you have people now, because they realise that speech is such a hot subject, they're trying to buy up data. And I'm often, and my colleagues are often contacted saying, look, can we have, you know, would you just give us your Te Reo Māori corpora? And then what these people are, are doing is that they're going to then take the corpora, they're going to build up, speech technology, they're going to sell up the market and then they're going to sell back by way of products to the target group, products which are made from the very data that they, their speech created. So the speech, it's really powerful, it's really exciting, but there are a lot of issues that we actually need to think about. And you don't, it's not just a straightforward case of whipping something up you need to think about a whole lot of issues. So I wanted to finish by um, just saying then that speech is a signal which is packed with information and using acoustic analysis and, and a lot of data, we can pull that out. 
We need a lot of data to study speech and identify the patterns because we have to account for statistical variation. And speech technology requires a lot of speech data to be fully functional. But speech is a taonga, it's a treasure, and we need to treat it with respect. So that's what I want to finish on. Thank you very much. I hope you found this interesting. Thanks. Bye.